Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm nervous. <laughs> and I'm Jennifer. My name's Jennifer and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> I've been kept sober since December 5th of 92, and that's my miracle. And Into Action and Richardson is my home group. And I'm twitching hard. Um, I think when I closed my eyes and opened them back up, the attendance in the room doubled. And I'm just, oh my, um, why are you people not at work, you know? <laughs> Uh, I would really like to thank the committee for inviting me. I kind of feel like I snuck into the drive-in in somebody's trunk. You know, it's just, this is amazing. And it's, I, uh, I, I, it is an honor and a privilege to get to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, this is an especially neat privilege. I'm, I uh, am, um, some speakers tell jokes right at the beginning. I just have to tell what happened in my day because, uh, and y'all are going to start feeling better about your lives. Um, <laughs> if anybody is delusional enough to think you get asked to speak at something like this because you've got it all together, <laughs> they messed up tonight. Because <laughs> I kept looking at the website going, have they found out yet? Nope, my name's still there. Okay. Um, I, uh. I, I bought a dress. Okay, yesterday, you know, I have to have a new dress. And so I didn't have time, and so I was at the Cracker Barrel. I am shopping for clothes <laughs> at the Cracker Barrel, and um, because I just, I don't have time. And so I find this dress, and apparently I'm still delusional, because I think I am much taller and much thinner than I am. And apparently, I think I'm really stacked. Um, <laughs> but the really funny part is that um, the dress, and I'll wear it because now I've told the story and you have to see it. This is not the dress from the Cracker Barrel. Um, but it's made out of, um, like, grandma bedspread material. And um, it was really cute on the hanger. <laughs> And then I put it on, and uh, I, there's a spider. Okay, um, and and I looked like Grandma's feather bed, and uh, <laughs> a queen size feather bed, and uh, and I'm, so you know, on the way I have to get a new dress, and uh, and I'm just laughing, going, you know, this is how my thinking works. The hanger, beautiful. Me, bed, and. Um, but I will wear it. I'll wear it tomorrow night, just so you can see. My, and um, But it, it really is good and to be here, and I'm going to start calming down just any second now. God's going to kick in, because I asked him to. Um, I am not an authority on Alcoholics Anonymous, 12 Steps, the 12 Traditions, or Alcoholism. Um, I'm only here to share my experience, strength, and hope, such as it is today. Um, and... Uh, it really is a privilege to be here. I love the setting. I was uh, sitting out on the patio reading We Agnostics and trying to get in a place where I could talk to you and, and looking out at the lake, and, and I, I feel God here, and, and I'm so privileged to be around people who have woohoo sobriety. I'm a big fan of woohoo sobriety, and, um, and uh, that's just a neat deal for me to find out that there are people who are just like me, and... Um, I have no clue what I'm going to tell you about tonight, probably what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. But if any of you have heard me before, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say. It just sort of flies out and we catch it later. Um, I was born at a very early age on November 16th <laughs> of 1966. I was born to a football coach and an English teacher, and they're very sweet people. Um, they're not alcoholics. I, I did not grow up on the firing line. I grew up with people who went to church and went to work and did the right thing even when nobody was looking. I, uh, I have one younger sister, and she's a good girl. She was always, well, she was a mullet when she was little, but, um, and she still has the capacity to be a mullet, but she keeps making me nieces, and so I like her now. Um, 
But she's a really sweet girl, and, and I know that we got all the same messages growing up. I know that she was told and taught the same things. I know that she came in t contact with the same people that I did. And she grew up and went to college and graduated, show off. And um, and she planned and got married, and she planned and had children, and she planned and bought a house. Um, when she graduated from college, she chose a career. And, um, you know, this really messed up my, my chances of blaming any of my alcoholism on my upbringing because she went to work for Jesus. And uh, she became a missionary in Bulgaria, and... Uh, I became a pool hall waitress. <laughs> I, I became convinced very early on that she only did the, the right thing to make me look bad. Um, but she's a good girl, and, and I was raised to be a good girl, but I had better ideas. You know, I grew up always looking over there with them doing something else. And uh, I have some redneck leanings. I drove into Oklahoma, and, whoo, it just felt good. <laughs> this, is, this is a garden spot for me. Um, I saw a redneck and some Wranglers with a denim shirt on and a Jeep, and I was like, honey, I'm home. Um, found a place called Ma and Pa's Reptiles and Lizards. <laughs> I like it here already. Um, I, I I was sort of raised a redneck, and um, <laughs> my first fantasy was that I would become a wrestler's valet. I was gonna man, I was gonna marry one of the Von Erics, and uh, I was going to have dinner parties for Andre the Giant and Willie Coconut, the midget, the midget wrestler. And uh, you know, my fantasies were not glamorous, but they were different. And uh, I just kept thinking if I could be over there with them doing that, I'd be okay. You know, from a very early age, I found out that I needed to um, develop some skills because you can't twitch the way that I twitch normally and not wind up in controlled living environments if you don't learn how to be funny. <laughs> and so I had to act like I meant to act this way, you know, and... Uh, but the truth was that I was always afraid. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I wasn't tall enough or blonde enough. I tried that twice. It's not a good plan. Um, you know, I didn't have a waist. And I'm just sure that life would be better for me if I had a waist. Um, and, and I just was always comparing my insides by your outsides. And, and everybody looked better than me. And everybody seemed calmer than me. And everybody seemed to know what they were doing. I was a twitcher from very early on, and, and I didn't know that I felt less than and apart from because I was so busy trying to elbow my way into the middle of everything. I went into high school, and life was good. You know, I'm a suck-up, and I'm a show-off, and I'm a talker, so, you know, everything rocked along pretty well for me, um, except on the inside. You know, I focused on all the things I didn't have and all the things that I wasn't, and that's what I became. Um... I was watching Rocky Horror Picture Show the other night, and I felt really old. Um, that, that's a big part of my story was Rocky Horror Picture Show. And, uh, you know, I discovered the underbelly of life and thought, this is where I need to be. <laughs> These people are freaks just like me. And, uh, and right around the time I hit 16, I mean, life was just not pretty for me. Um, I scared the boys to death. And so, but there was this guy. And he um, he moved to Plano. I grew up in the mean streets of Plano. And uh, the east side. Um, <laughs> but uh, this guy moved to Plano, and uh, he was everything that I would never be. He went to our church, and he was tanned. He was toned. He was coiffed. He had a waist. He was Barbie. He was... Uh, <laughs> And I wanted what he had, and I was willing to go to almost any lengths to get it. And uh, and he found me fascinating, too. As I said, I had a, a, had a sort of Rocky Horror Picture Show look going on. And, uh, you know, and I had air supply records at home. And I was the president of the youth group at church. And I was doing Rocky Horror at midnight. You know, I already had about six, eight lives going all at once. And just switch channels, you know. And... Uh, 
But he came into this church and, and, and we just hit it off. I mean, we connected in a really big way. And I fell in love as only a 16-year-old girl can. I mean, I was planning our wedding and naming our babies because we hated the same people. We were disillusioned about the same things. Um, he taught me how to shoplift. And we were both the same size, so it worked out great. This was the 80s, so girls were wearing ties anyway. And, um, and so we were out on a date one night, and um, <laughs> and he, he let me in on a little secret. We had something in common that I hadn't planned on, and that was that we both like boys better than we like girls. And um, so I decided I was either going to have to perform a miracle or get a sex change, and I was really mad at God. I was tired of this. You know, I felt like I was God's personal little practical joke, you know, that he would bring these wonderful things into my life and they go, psych, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, um, so that was about the time I decided that if he wasn't going to be my introduction to sin, then it was time to do some drinking because I was tired of being a good girl. Wasn't paying off the way that I wanted it to. And, and, um, you know, I came from a spiritual place. I came from spiritual parents, and, and I had a relationship with God. And for a long time, I used to say that I had a good relationship with God. The reality is my relationship with God was just like everybody else, my relationship with everybody else. When he did it my way, we were tight. And when he didn't, I'm done, you know. And so I decided that I would start sinning. And uh, my sinning started with two bottles of wine. I, uh, I started out a closet drinker. I sat in the floor of a closet. Um, I have heard many speakers talk about the first 15 minutes of their drinking being their, uh, their only exposure to social drinking. I had a resentment, two bottles of wine, and a closet floor full of shoes. Woohoo! It's a party. Um, and I sat in that, in that closet floor, and I, I drank a bottle of Boone's Farm Tickle Pink and a bottle of Real Sangria. Those are your starter wines. And um, I drank those two bottles of wine, and I'm not going to lie to you. I hated the way they tasted. It tastes like nail polish remover to me. But uh, I got it. Don't ask me how I know what nail polish remover tastes like. But... um. I drank those two bottles of wine, and I was so busy trying to keep it down that I couldn't really tell what alcohol did until it was time for me to come out of the closet, literally. And um, and the floor kind of shifted, as it will, after you've had your first two bottles of wine, and I slammed my face into the back of the closet door, and and that's when it happened. I knew there was a God, and I knew he lived on Boone's farm. Um, <laughs> I mean, doesn't it sound pretty? Tickle pink, strawberry hill. You know, I, I just, I couldn't feel my face. And I am, there are two things that are outstanding characteristics about me. I am intense and I am sensitive, which makes me intensely sensitive. And, um, and I mean, people recognize that from early on. My, my big old daddy would sit me down and he'd say, Jen, honey, I believe there's people who feel too much. And I would think, uh-huh. But he didn't know how to tell me that I was selfish and self-centered to the extreme and that perhaps I ought to try being of service to someone else. He just said, you really feel a lot, don't you, honey? And I said, uh-huh. But I drank those two bottles of wine, and I came out of that closet, and everything was okay. It didn't make me blonde. It didn't make me tall. It didn't make the big stuff smaller or the small stuff bigger. But what it did do was it made me okay. I didn't have to be those things. I didn't have to care. I didn't have to twitch. I didn't have to worry. And so I loved the way that made me feel. Now, I got sick. Um, we brag about puking in AA. And, uh, and I puked. Um, I puked a lot, actually. And because um, there was a little game involving the ceiling fan. You can make fun out of nothing when you're drunk. And... Uh, <laughs> And the ceiling fan was a bad move on my part, and so I got ill and um, went to sleep real fast, which is how I would describe it, all of my drinking. Went to sleep real fast. That's not passing out. That's just going to sleep real fast. And um, so I went to sleep real fast and uh, came to in the morning, and I had what I like to call angora teeth and chinchilla tongue. <laughs> it tasted like a hamster had slept in my mouth. 
and I had never been that thirsty in my life. I leaned over the bathtub, and I glugged down a couple of gallons of water. And because I'd never had any wine before, I didn't know that it turns you into a lava lamp, you know. And my <laughs> stomach was kind of going wah, wah, wah. And um, we were at a Hispanic girl's house, and we went downstairs, and her mother had made huevos rancheros. <laughs> I can't eat a, I can't look at a fried egg sober. You know, it's like, get that off your plate, please, quick. Um, and so, you know, I, I went and threw, puked again, and, uh, and then I got on a bus and went to sing for Jesus. Um, cause that's what I, that's what I'm all about. You know, I, I have this, this very deep desire to be a really good girl, to be sweet and to do the right thing and for everybody to like me. But on the other side, I want to feel the way that I felt when I drank. I wanted not to be afraid. I wanted not to have to worry. I didn't want to have to keep trying so hard. And it's embarrassing to say that at 16 years old I was exhausted, but I was exhausted. And I took a drink of wine, and it was like it should have said, fear be gone on the bottle, you know. I was not afraid anymore. It's like that line that says, you know, wearing the world like a loose garment. The problem is it just keeps getting looser and looser and looser, and um, pretty soon you're walking around naked. Um, no, I really didn't. Um, that's the only rule my daddy ever made that I kept. I'll just brag about that. He said, if it don't look good, keep it covered up. <laughs> um, and I believed him. <laughs> We were talking about all the festivities um, because I didn't hear sober quarters playing. Um, quarters is my sport. <laughs> and um, it's really the only sport I'm designed for, and uh, I can play some quarters. And I love that because I got to be around the guys. And, and to me, it was, it was like my ticket in. Uh, I could drink them under the table, and I tried to take advantage of them. But... Um, but if you get a guy drunk enough, there's nothing to take advantage of. <laughs> as soon as y'all stop laughing, I'm going to stop telling that. But I, I, Sorry, y'all just throw me a fish every time I say that one. So Anyway, that was my motive. It didn't work out that well. But, uh, you know, and the, and the guys pretty much treated me like their ugly little brother, but I got to be with them, and, uh, and I had a good time. Drinking was a lot of fun for me, and, uh, and it, it just felt good to be bad, but I wasn't that good at it. Um, and so I drank, and I drank every time I had the opportunity to. I got in trouble in high school. I was the president of everything, um, and, uh, and I went to jail with the gay boyfriend. Um, <laughs> He didn't stop being my boyfriend because he was gay, because he still looked good. And um, <laughs> that came in very handy, actually. Um, I was his beard. But um, but we were out one night, and, and uh, we're drunk. And I think, uh, anyway, we were drunk. And, uh, and, and the police car comes up behind me, and uh, I knew it wasn't my driving because I was doing some of that fine alcoholic driving where you lock your arms. And, uh, and you time your stops by the trees and stuff. You go, okay, when I get to the third tree, I'm going to slow down. And the problem was I wasn't paying any attention to the lights. And so I'd stop on green, go on red, whatever, just so that I got that stop thing down. And uh, But I, got, I went to jail the first time for stealing a street time. And uh, it took me, it wasn't a little street sign, it was a big street sign. It was in the back of my daddy's car and had a gay boyfriend with me and, uh, and we forgot about it. <laughs> and so the policeman pulled us over and he was absolutely convinced. I mean, Mr. High Drama, he was convinced it's because he peed in a park. And uh, I think that's a felony. Ah! You know, he's freaking out and, uh, and I'm freaking out and... Uh, Make a long story short, it took me two years of sobriety to realize that was alcohol related. <laughs> <laughs> what it said on the little paper was that it was a class B misdemeanor theft over twenty dollars. Um, 
it only occurred to me much later that I drive past street signs every day. And I never feel compelled to put one in my car. But when you've had about 12 California coolers, we need a sign, dude. Um, so we put it in the back of our, my daddy's Buick, and, uh, and I went to jail that night, and uh, it was so funny. He's in AA now, too. I forgot to tell that part. <laughs> Not a coincidence. Um, I had antennas early on. I knew. Woo! Um, but we went to jail, and, and I was crying, and he was in another cell, and he kept saying, tell your mom and dad it's my fault. And I thought, you can bet on it, buddy! <laughs> You don't have to suggest blame to a girl like me. Um, okay, the eating wincy spider is just going to hang with me for a while. Um, and so that's just, you know, these are the kinds of things that early in my drinking start happening. So it gets better. I, uh, I went off to school, and it was great driving up here because I got to pass some of the landmarks. I went to the beer, I, I drove past the beer barn. And uh, that's where I bought my first legal 12-pack. I was going to say six. I know I never bought a six-pack in my life. Um, we drove through it backwards. It was wonderful. I got to Denton, and, and it was just, I signed up to go to college. I didn't exactly go because it was scary. Um, I had been a big fish in a little pond at Plano East, and then I went to North Texas, and I made a lot of decisions by not making decisions, and, I moved in with a roommate who was much older than I was. She had a, let's call it an alternative lifestyle. She ran around with a bunch of drag queens, and I would come out in the morning, and like Joan Crawford would be sitting in our living room. <laughs> it's very scary to run around with men who have better lingerie than you do. Uh, <laughs> You know, but I absolutely, I thought that this was just a cultural experience. I'm finally out from under mom and dad's wing, and the party's on. And, and I started drinking on the square in, in Denton, and, and life was beautiful. My first night of drinking, and this is so creepy. I think I saw this guy today. I didn't speak to him. But um, <laughs> seriously, my first boyfriend in college, he was beautiful. Um, he was the perfect man. I met him my first night of legal drinking. He was 28, and he was a freshman. <laughs> he had been a freshman for 10 years. He had no job and no car. He's the perfect man. I love men with no jobs and no cars because they stay put. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can drop them off somewhere, and when you come back later, they're still there. <laughs> Clancy calls alcoholism a disease of perception, and I'm on board with that because I thought this guy was perfect, and I thought he was tremendously loyal. It never crossed my mind that he was still sitting there when I came back because nobody else wanted him. <laughs> but the first night that we met, we got drunk in a little bar, and, you know, we I put his bicycle in the back of my car. Um, and the honeymoon was on. Um, <laughs> He was a neat guy. He was a hippie wannabe. He uh, had long hair and a long beard. He didn't like shoes. He did a lot of hallucinogens. Don't you know my English teacher mama was proud. Um, and I just thought these people were so cool. They, they tripped on acid and they read Nietzsche and they listened to electronic harp music. They planned trips to go see the sea turtles mate, dude. And... Um, <laughs> And I just became a chaperone for their acid trips. You know, I'm running around with people who are living on buses. I've never even ridden a bus. And suddenly I'm around all these funky hippies, and it's so cool because I can blend. I became the chaperone for their acid trips. They would light these giant bonfires and strip off their clothes and go talk to Jesus. And, uh, and I would sit on the cooler. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and make sure nobody ran into the fire or touched sharp things. <laughs> but see, alcohol did that for me. It allowed me to blend. It allowed me to fit in. I had no idea what these people were about. I didn't understand four words that they were talking about. But when I drank, I felt like I fit in. 
Uh, I have a friend who says that alcohol uh, turned him into tofu. He took on the flavor of everything he was around. <laughs> and that's my story, too. You know, I, I hung with the hippies, and it was great. And uh, I liked having a boyfriend so much that I got a couple more. And uh, I got very different kinds of guys. There was a big black football player, and there was a little stoner dude, and there was a rock and roll guy, and there was, you know, and it was just, we are the world. And uh, <laughs> I was definitely equal opportunity. And um, I had no clothes. I just had costumes. And... Uh, and I just played dress up, and, and I, I became what I thought they wanted me to be because all I knew was that by myself I wasn't enough. And that's not what I was told. That's not what anybody told me. I was often told I was too much. But, um, but the way that I felt was that I was never enough, that I didn't measure up, that just any minute now, Somebody was going to find out, and they were going to kick me out. They were going to ask me to leave. They were going to tell me that I never belonged and I never need to come back. And so I just tried harder. And through it all, I drank, and life was wonderful. North Texas caught on. My academic career didn't last that long. And, um, and right around the time that North Texas was kicking me out, the boyfriends started finding out about each other. And none of them fought for my honor. Um... <laughs> Pretty much all of them said, nah, it's okay. <laughs> he can have you. Nah, it's all right, really. So I look up one day. I got no job. I got no school. My parents don't need Alan on. They're saying, if you're going to do it your way, feel free to pay your way, which I thought was really unkind. And um, so I decided that I was getting way too metropolitan for Denton. You know, I was practically grown. I'm 19, maybe 20, and uh, I have, you know, all of 12 hours of college behind me and uh, ready to choose a career. So I moved. Uh, I had to get out of Denton because the town was just too small. So I made my big geographic. I moved from Denton to Louisville. <laughs> I got one zip code away. I am not brave. Um, but I moved from Denton to Louisville, and before I even unpacked a box, I decided I was going to have to begin a new life, and, and most of the women know if you're going to get a new life, get new hair. And um, so before I even unpacked the boxes, I went to the hairdressers, and I was driving down Main Street in Louisville, and I looked across, you know, I was looking around trying to see who I was going to be in this town, and there was a life-sized orange horse downtown, and I thought, that's it. I'll be Patsy Klein. <laughs> So I went into the hairdresser shop, and uh, I said, tweezle me up some cowgirl hair. And that's what she did. This was the 80s, and we permed and permed and permed, and I've got hair. And so it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was really cool because she gave me a beer while she was perming my hair, and that helped a lot. Um, and then we did an asymmetric cut. So there was a big shrub on this side, not very much over here. <laughs> So it looked like I was confused at all times. <laughs> but I bonded, I bonded with the hairdresser just right away. Because I sat down in her chair and she said, you party, don't you? And because I had been running around with, with all those hippies, I knew it was my aura. I had a purple party aura. And uh, she could see that from, from, you know, just snip, snip. And she was like, you party. I didn't know that Coors Light was coming out of my pores. <laughs> so she offered me a beer, and, and by the end of the tweezling, she had invi invited me out to the honky tonk. So I went, and I got myself some hot pink ropers and a belt buckle the size of my head. <laughs> and that night, she took me to Lake Dallas. Um... And we went to the Moonlighter. Now, um, I like honky-tonks, and when I'm in North Dallas, I have to explain that just because they have country music does not make it a honky-tonk. Um, I like places where the dress code is toothless and tattooed. I want dually trucks in the parking lot and gun racks with guns on them. Um, when I walk into a bar, I don't want to see more than three women. I would prefer that one of them's name is Meemaw. <laughs> I, 
I want to walk in the bar and know that I'm getting the gold, the silver, or the bronze. And... Uh, I used to say that I fell in love with the honky-tonks the very first time I walked in, and that is not true. The truth is, I walked in, and it looked kind of like the J.C.'s spook house. It was dark, it smelled bad, and people grabbed you, and you couldn't figure out where the hands came from. <laughs> but I will tell you that something magic happened in those bars. You know, I, I listened to a little Patsy Cline, and I drank some long necks, and I drank some shots, and by the end of the night, Papaw was twirling me. And I was the hillbilly homecoming queen. You know, life is going to be good. And that bar became just like those wrestling matches for me. It became real. Everything that I was looking for was going on in that bar. There was loving and fighting and cussing and hormones all over the place. And, uh, and I just had a good time out there, you know. And I drank and I shot pool and, and I uh, fell in love. That's what I do. It's a hobby of mine. And... Um, <laughs> I fell in love almost every night. Um, <laughs> but I started getting in some trouble. Now, by day, you know, by night I am a honky-tonk homecoming queen. By day, I am a preschool teacher. <laughs> now, this is not a good career choice if you're going to be hungover every morning of your life. And uh, so I come in, you know, in your designer flip-flops. The wrinkled shorts that you've been walking over for three or four days, a t-shirt that you kind of straightened out, and uh, I got that bed head going on, dragon breath, and uh, here I come to the daycare. All right, here we go. And there's 18 four-year-olds going, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer. <laughs> so we just kind of start the day going, y'all. Less paste, okay? <laughs> I don't care what you paste, paste each other, eat the paste. <laughs> you know, I, even the kids were a little freaked out by me, you know? But they were four year olds and they caught on. You know, somebody would start walking towards me and one of the other little kids would go, Where's the blood? Where's the fire? Leave her alone. Um, <laughs> Because that's kind of how I treated them, you know. And uh, and I liked teaching preschool. I loved those babies, and I wanted to be good to them. But, you know, I had this emptiness inside, and I had this fear, and I had this shame. Because as an alcoholic woman, drinking in those bars and going to those places that I went, I wound up in situations drunk that I needed to be sober to get out of. And I was not sober. And I had to do whatever was necessary to continue to drink or to get out of the situation I had gotten myself into. And it was absolutely baffling to me that that kept happening. And I kept wondering, why didn't I see this coming? But you see, every day, as, as it neared 5 or 6 o'clock, you know, I would just think, I'm just going to go have a couple. I'm just going to get the edge off. I have earned this. I have earned this. And I just need a little relief because, you know, this is a stressful job. There's all these people. And these little people and their parents, and they want to know where the socks are, and they want to know where the toys are, and have you seen Claire? Pick, 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 you know? <laughs> now, but by night I'm going to these honky-tonks, and, and for a while it was just a lot of fun, but... I found that, and here's a little hint, if anybody's new and you're not sure whether you're an alcoholic, here's my little tip. If pacing has become a problem for you, you might be an alcoholic, because pacing was my obsession. I really needed to be upright when the fun was going to start, and I had no clue what time the fun was going to start, so that throws you off a little. So I had to figure out sort of a ratio of beer and a shot, beer and a shot, beer... Beer and a shot, beer and a shot, beer. And I drink, you know, beer for an hour or two and then beer and a shot because you just want to kind of be flying sideways. You know, not too boing and not too droopy. You just got to figure out how to manage it. And I'd miss, I'd miss the mark over and over and over again. And then at the end of the night, I'd go shot, 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 shot. Now, if you're going to drink that way, here's another little tip. Hurry home. <laughs> 
Because as I said, you get sleepy real fast. And I lived on the third floor, because that's where drunks live. You know, that $30 off your rent's real important. And, uh, and I'd get home after having had shot, 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 shot. And, uh, and I'd just look at those stairs. And I'd need to meditate a little bit on it. You know, it's hard to convince yourself you're drinking normally when you come to in your car in the morning. What day is it? Where am I supposed to be? What kind of lie am I going to have to tell today? You know, and uh, and I'm coming into the daycare in all sorts of shape, shades of disarray. And, and there, thank God I worked in daycare because there's all those helper women there and they wanted to help me. And... Uh, and they'd call me into the office and they would say, you know, Jennifer, we really like you. And we want to see you succeed. How can we help you? And I always have an answer for that. If you ask me tonight, how can you help me? My car's dirty. Um, I always have some kind of suggestion of things you can do for me. And so they asked me how they could help. And I said, well, let's start the day a little later. <laughs> they went for it. <laughs> so, you know, I went from 8 o'clock to 8.30. Little baptism there. Um, I went from 8:30 to 9, 9 to 9:30, 10 o'clock, and um, and then we ran out of day. We couldn't scoop my hours back anymore, and you know they were just so picky about that morning thing. So they'd call me into the office again, and they'd say, Jennifer, really, we like you. How can we help you? And uh, and I didn't really have an answer. And uh, and they so they made me sign those little papers that they give to people like us. Do you understand? And we want you here in the morning functioning. Going to get a little rigid about that. And uh, <laughs> so I'd sign the little paper that said, I understand, morning here functioning. And, you know, as I was walking out of the office, I would say, you know, I really appreciate it. You guys have been great. I love working here. I love these kids. Thank you so much for your patience. But I'm an alcoholic. And I got a mind that's out to kill me. And I would turn around and take ten steps, and my mind would start twisting that around. And I would think, who does she think she is? I mean, she knows what she pays me. And besides, I give 147% for the two hours that I'm really funky. <laughs> There's absolutely nobody here who's better than me during those two hours that I'm really functioning. You know, and... And, and there's all these kids, and some of them don't even behave very well. And why in the world, who does she, I mean, she's lucky I show up here in the morning. And by the time I leave, I am so tense. I, I, I mean, I had planned to go home and go to bed, put on, like, night clothes and get in the bed. And, and uh, you know, and tomorrow's going to be a really good day. But, but, I mean, I start to drive home, and I'm just tense. And I can already tell I'm not going to be able to go to sleep because, I mean, I'm just so persecuted. These people are out to get me. And the only way I'm going to be able to wind down, the only way I'm going to be able to get some relief is just to go have a couple of drinks. And I go to that bar. By then I had stopped taking my show on the road. I would gotten two DWIs in less than six months. That happens to party girls. And um, <laughs> one of them was really kind of funny. I, um, Well, the first one was, you know, that just, it was just, one of the dangers of drinking. The second one, it was an emergency, and the cops so didn't see it my way. I ran a red light in front of the police station. But um, but I explained to him that it was an emergency. It was like 3 in the morning, and um, I needed some egg rolls. <laughs> and Jack in the Box was about to close. You know, you don't eat before you drink because it ruins the buzz. But at 3 in the morning, you're just hungry. And so he took me to jail again, and, and the state of Texas becomes convinced I have a drinking problem, and I become convinced I have a driving problem. So I moved next door to my bar of choice, problem solved. I started doing some outside issues because I found it allowed me to drink bionically. It also allowed me to be a very quick preschool teacher. We could do the whole lesson plan by 10 o'clock. Let's go! You know, and um, it was like sonic puppet shows. You know, I'm just going and uh, <clears throat> and if that doesn't frighten you it should um, you know and I that's not how I was raised I was not raised to do those things as a matter of fact for years I turned down outside issues because they're bad and they're wrong and they're illegal 
And I heard my daddy one time say, how sorry would you have to be? And I thought, pretty sorry. But there was this night, and I was at a Halloween party. I was dressed like a bag lady, and a friend of mine invited me into the bathroom, offered me a little powder, powdery substance. I said, mm, bad, wrong, illegal. I don't do that. And she said the magic words. She said, it'll make you last as long as the party. And I said, get out of the way. <laughs> because that pacing thing, as I told you, you know, it becomes problematic for me. And, and so I started doing those other things, and it was a really great diet. Um, but I, I scared other people when I drank. I frightened myself on drugs um, because the curtains started talking to me. And I would say, I can't understand you. And the curtains would go, wow, wow. And I, I still can't understand you. <laughs> Got a little paranoid on that stuff. And uh, street signs started following my car. And uh, <laughs> so I, I had to stop doing those things. And I put on 100 pounds in 24 hours. I mean, it was like, <laughs> boom. Um, <laughs> All the guys at the bar were like, mm, don't do speed anymore, do you? <laughs> uh, because I was eating Taco Bell in a blackout. And um, <laughs> it was really kind of cute because even in a blackout, I am concerned about appearances. I would drive through Taco Bell and order food, um, lots of food, and four drinks. Like I'm taking it home to the family at 2 in the morning. <laughs> My babies are hungry. <laughs> You know, and things are just completely out of control. You know, I'm having to change tires that are not flat. I'm, I knocked my oil pan off my car and just kept driving. <laughs> that tips the old cops right off. Because apparently, flames shoot out of the bottom of your car. <laughs> so, um, and the, I mean, there are just some things I, I, you know, I wound up a couple of times with three flat tires all at once. And that's... A, that's really hard. <laughs> That's hard sober. Um, and, you know, and I called my dad, and, and bless his heart, he didn't know what to do. You know, he comes and he, he can't even speak. It was so cute, the little vein in his forehead's like, Ugh! and uh, and he'd just walk around the car and he'd go, Whoa! you know, dig, you know, and, uh, and he'd ask me those questions. He asked the questions that they asked drunks. He'd go, Ow! <laughs> and it's, you know, it's one of those easy ones. I even know the answer to this one, but he doesn't want to hear it. You know, because the real answer is, Dad, there's curbs on both sides. <laughs> you know, things are just getting more and more out of control. I fell in love with Opie Taylor. Um... He was he was a redheaded stepchild. He looked he was tall and skinny. We looked like spaghetti and meatball together. And um, and he was disguised as an Allen on. The first night I met him, he made a beer last like two hours, and I thought this guy's gonna come in handy um, because I really was needing a caddy for the drinking game. Things were getting real sloppy in my life. I was drinking all night, going home and crying, and then coming to in the morning, calling my job to tell him my allergies were acting up. I didn't even know I was telling the truth. I had no idea that I had an allergy to alcohol that meant that I absolutely would never be able to drink normally and that I had a head that was absolutely out to kill me because it was going to tell me this time it's going to be different. Today is a new day. So I brought, I brought Opie into the game, and uh, we it was so romantic. We had a wonderful, wonderful two-week honeymoon. We moved into somebody else's trailer. He didn't have a place. I didn't have a place, but we, I still knew some people. So... We moved into somebody else's trailer, and, and uh, what I didn't know when I met him was that he was tapering off of alcohol, and that when we got together, he needed to taper right back on. And so we had dueling alcoholism, and, and it was so romantic. We played really fabulous romantic games. We played Let Me the Hell Out of the Car, <laughs> and uh, I see we have some veterans here. Um <laughs> Those of you who didn't play, it is very dramatic if you will leap out of a moving vehicle. <laughs> but by the time I screamed to let me the hell out of the car, um, he was ready to stop. You know, it was like, no, fine, go. Um, 
It was my car. He had no car. <laughs> but um, he'd let me out of the car, and then I became the hider, and he became the seeker. And um, for those of you who really want to get good at this game, don't don't stay on the road where he let you out. Because the jo his job is to drive around, start feeling guilty, and go look for you. So you got to hide. And uh, I'm the reigning champion of this game. I, I hid inside a car wash one night. And uh, just up against the wall. <laughs> and, uh, he'll never find me here. <laughs> and he didn't. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you forgot we were playing. I <laughs> have no idea. <laughs> but uh, and this is like a Tuesday. I don't do this crap on the weekends. This is my normal everyday stuff. And. <laughs> So the sun starts accidentally coming up, and I'm still standing against that wall going, uh-oh, this is bad. I'm five miles from home, probably need to start getting ready for work, and I'm standing in a car wash. And uh, So I hike home, and I have to make up another lie, and these stories are getting more and more outrageous, and I'm not believing them anymore. I can't tell a lie that I believe anymore. This stuff is crazy. I start comforting myself with the idea that I have a brain tumor. Only alcoholics go, that would be good news. Man, that would explain a lot right there. See, that's the kind of thinking I have because if I'm an alcoholic, I need to quit drinking. I already knew that much. They made me go to drunk defensive driving. Pfft, what a waste of time that was. They gave me that little cardboard wheel that tells you how much you can drink and not get drunk. <laughs> That's a stupid plan. Because um, I was about this size and I'm adding on pounds going, a beer every two hours? You gotta be kidding. So I went up to the little instructor at drunk defensive driving and I said, your wheel is wrong. <laughs> I said, you know, there's no little category on there. I'm a big girl and there's no little category on there for tolerance. And I built up some tolerance and he said, the problem is not with the wheel. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot of handy things. I went to drug and alcohol counseling and found out my problem was people pleasing. So I stopped. <laughs> I have fully recovered from people pleasing. I have not pleased anyone in a very long time. <laughs> You know, they gave me goofy things to do in these drug and alcohol classes. They asked me to write out a list of my triggers. <laughs> triggers a horse. Uh, and I mean, I, I really, it's so funny because I look back now and I go, oh, that was the point. Because I'm writing down things like Jimmy Buffett songs, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Oxygen. I mean... <laughs> What's a, what's a trigger? I mean, I drink because I drink. That's how I know how to respond to life. And, and what do you mean, trigger? But so this stuff didn't take. You know, they sent me to two AA meetings. It was so creepy. Um, <laughs> oh, Lord. They made those things at 8 o'clock at night. I mean, this is right in the middle of my prime drinking time, and I'm supposed to be going to an AA meeting. So I drove around a group, you know. And out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous and alcoholics of your type, I didn't have a drink before I went to an AA meeting. Because I was pretty sure you'd smell it on me and go, whew, that smells good. <laughs> I need me a beer. And a uh, little problem with perception there, you know. And, and I'm thinking, I don't want to be responsible for any of you guys drinking, so I'm trying not to take a drink before I go to an AA meeting. First meeting I went to, it was a speaker meeting, and Donnie and Marie were speaking. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. This shiny, happy people. <laughs> and they're sober! <laughs> I have not had a drink all day. <laughs> I'm looking like Bill the Cat, you know. <laughs> Every word they say sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wow, wow, wow. The Lord's Prayer! Look at the Lord's Prayer! It was awful! Awful! These people were so tickled they didn't drink! <laughs> but you people have never had a good drink in your lives. 
if you are this excited about not having it in your body, because I haven't had any all day, and I'm about to kill somebody dead. <laughs> Went to a second meeting, because my drug and alcohol counselor said, try again. And it was a... It was a discussion meeting, and you really freaked me out there. Because you laugh at stuff that is not funny, and you tell things you should never tell. <laughs> I can remember sitting in this meeting here, and people go, and then I stole my mama's car and I wrecked it. <laughs> Just, oh, great. <laughs> I'm so glad you have a place to go. <laughs> you know, I had to sit in those meetings and not let anything splash up on me, you know, because they were talking about stealing their parents' jewelry, and I thought, I never stole, I never stole their jewelry. I pawned it. But, um, <laughs> but I'm getting it back, you know. I'm getting it out before they even notice it's gone. And uh, so I'm not like you people. And, uh, and I don't flop, and I don't fight, and it's just going to be okay. You know, if I find the right man, if I find the right bar, if I get the right combination, beer shop, beer shop, beer here, um, it's all just, just going to be okay. And, and uh, the problem was it, it wasn't. You know, it, gradually things got worse. And that loneliness and that desperation. You know, I couldn't stay home because I was, I was living alone, and I was locked in an apartment with the woman I hated most on the planet. And I went to the bar and I told everybody to just leave me alone. You know, I, my delusion is that I picture myself drinking a cocktail, something frozen. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, I'm wearing a miniskirt and looking good. And across the bar, he walks in and I go, and he said, you yeah. <laughs> know. I don't remember suffering and humiliation. I did not drink that way. I wore a pair of sweats. I looked like Pat from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> there was a guy that hit on me in that bar, and he was an alcohol. I guess no, he was a bad drunk. I don't know. He may not be the A word, but he was a bad drunk, and he got drunk and did woodwork. And uh, he kept coming in with fewer fingers. <laughs> you know, and we're drunk, telling him maybe you ought to find another hobby, dude. <laughs> Now, this is not glamorous. This is not the beer commercials. This is, there's nothing cool about this. And yet I still have the delusion that someday it will be. I can still remember back when it was fun. I can still remember back when I was meeting the people I wanted to meet and hanging with the guys that I wanted to hang around with and doing the things I thought I wanted to do. And yet I'm going into this bar every single day, dying one day at a time. And I can't tell you why. Um, I went to jail on a felony DWI, and they took me to Lou Sterrett. That's where I had my moment of clarity. I always recommend... Lou Sterrett is a good place to have one. Um, because in there, I found some girls um, who were rough. And, uh, you know, and I'm standing in there going, what's a nice girl like me <laughs> doing in a place like, now, mind you, I look like Pat. And I've been wearing those same sweats for a long, long time. Um, but I'm, I'm sitting in that jail cell, and I'm just thinking, this isn't right. There's been a big, huge mistake. And I, I don't want to keep winding up in these places because... Because bad things are happening, you know, and, and I've started driving around in my car in blackouts, and I've started wondering how bad it's going to have to get and how scary it's going to have to be. And am I going to have to kill somebody before I'm done? What's it going to take? Absolutely. What is it going to take? Because I've been sitting in that bar for a year solid talking about um, I was playing Russian roulette with my car. I never gave up my keys, and I drove every single night. And I knew I was going to kill myself or somebody else. I knew it. And yet fear would not keep me from taking that first drink. Absolutely would not keep me from taking that first drink. I got that DWI and I sat in that jail cell. And that's when I realized that uh, I went to jail because of my drinking. Not because of my driving. Not because of him or the job or them. It was a Tuesday. There was no reason for me to drink that day except that's the only way I know how to get through the day. And there was no party left in my partying. And yet I kept going back to that bar waiting for it to get fun again, and it was desperate, and I was lonely. Opie went in the Navy, <laughs> and we got engaged. Uh, so we could fight ship to shore. It was fabulous. <laughs> you know, and I, I was really hurt that I had been abandoned like that, but the truth was he was running for his life, you know. After living with me for a couple of years, a boat full of hairy legs looked good, and uh, 
And we kept having to call off the wedding because he got thrown in the brig and, and I was drunk in the bar and it was just bad, you know. I sat in that jail cell and suddenly I started thinking about AA meetings. Funny how that happens. <laughs> AA doesn't sound that bad. You know, I could go to a meeting. And so, uh, you know, I, I asked God to help me that night. And I'd like to tell you, I zipped into AA. I became a member in good standing. And uh, I've been happy, joyous, and free ever since. But that wouldn't be my story. My story is I drove around a group for 10 days getting desperate enough to walk in, trying to find the humility. You know, and, and the truth was that by the day I got, I walked in, I was suicidal. I was absolutely ready to die, and I was in so much trouble, and I was in so much fear, and I'd had to move back home, and, and I, I just looked in the mirror, and I, was, I hated who I saw. I didn't know her, but I hated her. I went to a 10 o'clock meeting at the Plano group. I'd been driving around a group for 10 days from 7 in the morning until late at night. And I couldn't yet walk in. But I walked in that night and I made a deal with God that I would stay for one meeting. And if he gave me something to hang on to, I'd come to one more. I will be forever grateful that I walked into an AA meeting that night. I think it's real important that if on our doors it says Alcoholics Anonymous, people need to walk into an AA meeting. They had a first step meeting for me. And each of those people in that room described in their own words about the phenomenon of craving. They gave me that missing piece. They explained to me why I couldn't walk in that bar and have two or three, why I couldn't make a decision to leave at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and leave. I had been watching people go into bars with watches on night after night after night, and they'd say, oh, look at the time, and they would leave. And I couldn't figure out at first why they would leave. And years later, I couldn't figure out how they could leave. Because I couldn't. Once I put any alcohol in my body whatsoever, I'd turn my will and my life over to the care of alcoholism. And it was going to do with me as it chose. And it was like the light bulb came on over my head. I realized that I didn't pick alcoholism out of the catalog, but there was a solution. They talked to me about sponsorship. They talked to me about, about the first step. They talked to me about God as they understood it. And I sat and I cried. And I cried for months and months and months, you know. Um, that night after the meeting, they took me to Denny's because I, I went because I thought that's where you filled out the paperwork. <laughs> you know, that first meeting was really amazing to me because, uh, the girl who chaired the meeting had on a leather, a leather biker jacket and she had long red hair and she was tough. She could say, uh, God and the F word all in the same sentence. She was cool. And she gave me my first desire chip. My only desire chip. She gave me my first day a hug. And in my arrogance, I looked at her and thought, if they can teach her how to hug, they'll do wonders for me. I was really insulted when I told those people that I was an alcoholic. And I also told them I was a thief, a whore, and a liar. And they smiled. And they nodded. I thought they should at least cry with me because I knew that once I admitted that I was an alcoholic to these people, something inside of me knew that, that it was all over. But you see, God recycles. Because to me, the worst day of my life was December 5th of 1992. And today, the best day of my life was December 5th of 1992 because that's my prayer, that it's all over. That I don't ever have to go back there and live that way again. That I don't ever have to experience that fear and that terror and that disgust with myself. That I don't ever have to look in my family's eyes and see terror. That I don't ever have to give explanations for things I can't explain anymore. That's my prayer. God was so gentle. Before I had him, I had you. And I fell in love with your stories. I went to those meetings because I became my soap opera. And I had to, I had to find out, you know. I had to find out if Chris and Richard were breaking up today, you know. I had to find out if Mike got a job. I had to find out if the members in our group who had cancer were, were going to be there one more day. And see, I was fascinated by those people. I watched two people in my first year die sober and two people die drunk. And it ruined my idea of one more happy hour. I saw the difference in a celebration of life with somebody who died sober. And I saw the difference in a, in a morning that people sat in our rooms and never tried what we do. And I decided which one I wanted then. 
You know, I figured if you got cancer, you had to get out of jail free card. You know, you don't have to stay sober anymore. <laughs> and, um, but you know, I'm so grateful that those people talked to me and they explained to me that it was more important that they came when they were ill because they were going to go home soon and they wanted to say goodbye before they left. They wanted to sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous before they went home. And see, I saw that. That was bookmarked in my mind, and, and I got active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I started stalking a sponsor because I thought you had to have one. <laughs> you know, I, I really thought everything anybody said in meetings was rules, you know, and, and I, I heard everybody talk about this sponsor thing, and I thought you had to have one, and so I started stalking one, and, and, uh, <laughs> They said, look for somebody you can relate to. Now, this is a dumb plan when you are new and crazy. Because the people I can relate to are crazy. And uh, <laughs> I got a head that's going in 96 directions at any given moment. And I'm sitting in this meeting going, doo, 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 who can I relate to? Who can I re and there she was. You know, she was talking in 86 different directions. I thought, oh, my God, it's the mothership. <laughs> I went running over to that lady and I said, would you be my sponsor? And she said, yeah. Uh, I said, well, how long have you been sober? And she said, four days. <laughs> but I just kept going back. I kept going back and they bullied me. I mean, people in AA will just watch you to death. You have a sponsor? You have a sponsor? You have a sponsor? You need a sponsor? You're going to get a sponsor? You know, and my problem was that at that group, the women traveled in little herds, little herds and packs of women. And, just, mm. and we're doing this, and we're doing that, and we're all doing it together. Great, 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 great. <laughs> Come to the women's meeting. We need you at the women's meeting. Gotta go to the women's meeting. <gasps> but good Lord, I don't like you people one-on-one. -on -one. I don't need a whole pack of you. <laughs> sober for a while playing poker with the boys and uh because i didn't have any money to get drunk um in aa the guys watch your cards when you're playing poker and they want to see what you called and uh so i lost a lot of money um because i cheat and um i was at the poker game after the meeting with the guys and uh, and i said you know that they're really they're getting on to me about this women's meeting thing and i said you know what that is that that that's the he women man haters club <laughs> i said well i don't want any of that because uh, I like you. <laughs> and uh, But they just kept bullying me, and, and I, I finally went to the women's meeting, and sure enough, there were the hovercraft. Oh, she's here! Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. And I just hugged and patted and hugged and patted. And I got my first sponsor there. You know, she had she had several years of sobriety, and, uh, and she was a nice lady, and I, I wanted to be a nice lady. That's the most I thought I could ask of Alcoholics Anonymous because I had never had given away or compromised whatever I thought a nice lady was. And I asked her to be my sponsor. She had not worked all 12 steps, but I didn't know you needed to ask. She had multiple years of sobriety, and she gave me things to do. She made me pick up Janet from another planet. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, God love her, Janet was one of my teachers in AA. Janet heard voices that no one has ever heard before. Janet was from far, far away, and she had problems other than. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I like to laugh about Janet, but Janet was a really sweet girl. Uh, she was just crazy. And so I, um, I would go pick up Janet, and we drove, you know, a mile to the group, and she would ask the same question six times. <laughs> How old are you? 26. She'd talk about, the, How old are you? 26, Janet. <laughs> Still 26. <laughs> then on the ride home, she'd say, how old are you? I'm thinking, much older now, Janet. <laughs> Janet carried around this giant bag, and in this giant bag, apparently she had all her worldly goods. And uh, Janet would sit in the meeting. My sponsor was mean. She made me sit down and stay sat down. Mm. And, uh, and Janet was up and down and up and down and up and down. She had this giant bag full of stuff, and like meals would come out of her bag in the middle of the meeting. <laughs> Janet one time shaved her legs in a meeting. <laughs> and of course, you know, McGruff the crime dog is going. <laughs> Everybody else is just having a meeting. I am so, because I brought her to the meeting. I am responsible. So I got to check out Janet. What is she doing now, you know? I 
take Janet home from the meeting, and, and, and I'd get back to the group to detox after an hour with Janet. <laughs> and I would not be in there five minutes, and the phone would ring. And then it would be Janet's. And they'd say, Jennifer, it's for you. <laughs> Your special friend. <laughs> and I would answer the phone, and Janet would say, I need a ride to the next meeting. I'm thinking, I just dropped you off. <laughs> And I'd go back and get her. And, and, you know, but Janet was one of my teachers because my sponsor told me I had an enormous ego and I didn't believe her. <laughs> None of my friends even played along. I was like, you're not going to believe it. She said I had an enormous ego. And they just, <laughs> cue cards, please. <laughs> no, Jennifer, you don't have a huge ego. No. But Janet taught me because I was in the car with her one day and I was going to help her because Janet needed some help. And I said, Janet, you know, I go to those meetings because my life depends on it. Because I desperately need the things that they say in those meetings. And, uh, and it would really help me out. Really help me out. If you wouldn't eat your fruit cup and shave your legs and get up and down and up and down. Through the whole meeting. I mean, could you do me a flavor and, you know, stop? And she looked at me, you know, just with all this seriousness in the world. And, and you know, she said, how old are you? <laughs> But Janet got out of my car, and I started laughing, and I started crying, and I started banging my head on the screen. And just for one brief and shining moment, I saw my enormous ego. That I am so arrogant, I think Janet needs to change so that I can be comfortable instead of I need to change so that Janet can be whoever the heck she is. Janet was my teacher. And I had all kinds of teachers like that. I had people who showed up at meetings day after day after day. There was a man at my home group who sat up at the group with me. He was making me cry every time because he's still my friend. He sat up at that group with me until I said it was time to go home. He would sit up there till 3 or 4 in the morning. And we'd talk AA. And he'd listen or he'd talk. And he never did anything inappropriate, though I kind of wanted him to. <laughs> but, um... But he just sat there, and he was so kind, and he was so graceful that I didn't know he was there to help me. I thought he just had nothing better to do. I thought he had nowhere more important to go. And these are my teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous. They raised the bar for me because I didn't get an easy way out. I didn't get to say, ooh, I'm running late. I'll just zip into the meeting, and I'll just zip out. Somebody sat at that group with me until I said it's time to go home, until I was safe. He 12-stepped me night after night after night for a year and a month, and I didn't even know that he knew how afraid I was, and I didn't. The, the first sponsor, um, she took me through the steps that she knew how to take me through, but she hadn't worked them all. And in a year and a month of sobriety, I put myself in a situation that was very similar to one I put myself in drinking, and I acted and reacted the exact same way, and it scared me to death. I had a secret. I went somewhere with a guy that somebody said, don't go with, but he was in AA. We have sponsors, and we're doing all these things, and, um, you know, we were just going to go watch a video. <laughs> Rightio. Um, and I didn't act or react any different. And something happened I didn't want to happen, and I didn't think that kind of stuff could happen sober. And I had to sit in meetings with that man month after month after month. And I had that secret. And my sponsor told me that she could no longer sponsor me because I was pa passing her in the steps. My God works right on time, and I've been going to the Magdalene House. It's a 10-day recovery center for girls and I, women. And I always say girls. Um... And I was going to spew my message, and God put somebody in my path, the lady I called the Bulldog. It seemed to me that she had a big book strapped to her leg. <laughs> and when she walked into the room, I heard that cowboy music. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't hug and she didn't pat. What she did was she waited for me to spew my message, and then she'd throw the book at me. She would open up to some page in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and she would dispute my theories about Alcoholics Anonymous with the text of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been reading that book every night, but I'd been reading it by myself, and I didn't, understood, I didn't understand that the book was about me, but she did. And she saved my life because I sat down with her one evening, and I asked her how you find a sponsor, and she opened it up to page 18. But the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty, that he obviously knows what he is talking about, that his whole deportment shouts at the new man that he has a real answer. 
And that's what she did. She read the book to me. What happened to me is the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, exactly as they're written. I have a sponsor today who is, who is both a hug and pat and sponsor and a, and a mama lion. She kicks me when I think she should pat me, and she pats me when I think she could kick me. And she keeps me moving in Alcoholics Anonymous. What happened to me is the program of action. I do things differently today. I don't have it all together. You know, I went for a year without a job, and, and I got terrified that God, God had left me, that I wasn't doing it right, that I had been trying all these things, that I had been sponsoring people and going to meetings and speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking, which my sponsor said was too much. But, you know, they asked me. <laughs> and, uh, and I just kept thinking, what am I doing wrong? What am I leaving out? Because I'm listening to these tapes, and I hear these people who are getting the houses and the cars and the husbands and the stuff and the stuff and the stuff. And all I've got is freedom. All I've got is freedom. I don't have to live the way I live anymore. I don't have to wake up in midair. I found a God in Alcoholics Anonymous that is as real as you and me. And I'll just tell you one more thing and then I'm going to sit down. I was sitting out there looking at the water. And I remembered when my Uncle Gary taught me how to float. And what he would say is he'd, he'd say, I have my hand underneath you. But in a minute, I'm going to move my hand, and God's going to put his hand underneath you. And that's how I learned how to float. In Alcoholics Anonymous, it seems to work just a little bit differently. God says to me, my hand is always underneath, me, underneath you. But if you forget that, the hand of AA will always be there for you. And that's what you've done for me, and the very least that I can do is reach my hand out to you. I'm glad to be here. It's good to be so. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.